I haven't met you yet, I'm one of the pastors at Christ Fellowship. I've been around since Moses. My name is Pastor Matt Pilot. I come from the north, from the Stewart campus area, but I'm kind of working through all the campuses and Gardens campus. I want to tell you I love you. I love this ministry. I love this age group. I have my family from the north, from Martin County. Would you, family, raise your hands up here in the front. And I've got two young adults and then her fiance, her young adults, and uh, I love having them. So I, I very much, uh, Pastor Lewis is a dear, dear friend of mine. Uh, him and his wife, Kalisa, are friends and they're great leaders. Are you thankful for Lewis and Kalisa pastoring and leading? Lewis, I talked to so many young adults, and how are you here? Well, Lewis dragged me here. Lewis, Lewis brought me, Kalisa brought me here. And then I have a new friend who's been here for a while, but uh, he's part of the young adult team, and I love him. Uh, a great man of God, gifted man, William Crowell. How many know who William Crowell is? Raise your hand in the back there. Tall, white, tall guy with a white shirt. And uh, he, he works with me and Lewis, and he's part of young adults. So it's so good to be with you tonight. Uh, I, I've been praying about this message. I was given kind of the message and, the, and the, the theme, but I've been praying, and I believe that God has something for you individually. And whatever I say or do, I hope that you sense there's something for you tonight that you leave different. Uh, you're in this sermon series. Everybody say it. Jesus never said that. Now, how many know people put words in your mouth that you didn't say it that way or you didn't get that, right? They misinterpret, misquote. And I think poor Jesus gets misquoted sometimes, you know? He didn't say that. I think last week you guys talked about um, just follow your heart. How many were here last week? Great, great thought. Just follow your heart. But Jesus never said that. And so I want to uh, read, read a couple. I don't have it on the screen for you, but I've got a couple of multiple choice to test you in your theology if you tell me of the three choices, uh, what Jesus didn't say, okay, listen closely. The first is A, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. That's A. B is, as a man, I am flesh and blood. I can be ignored, I can be destroyed, but as a symbol, I can be incorruptible, I can be everlasting. And then C is, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength. Now, which one did Jesus not say? B. B. What, who said that? Batman. Batman fans. I love Batman. Come on. I love it. I love it. Batman said, I can, I can be a symbol. I can be more. Jesus didn't say that. Batman did. Okay, one more, one more. Here's another one. Listen closely. Here's what, figure out which of these three Jesus didn't actually say. I want to see if you know your Bible. A is, whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. B is, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And C is, the world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently until you let it in. You, me, nobody is going to hit as hard as life. Now, which one did Jesus not say? Now, who said that? You love Rocky like I do? Show Rocky, come on now. Hey, whenever you're feeling sorry for yourself, don't listen to Jesus, listen to Rocky. He said, life ain't so sunshine and rainbows. It's gonna knock you to your knees. I love that scene. Here's one more, here's one more. Last one. A, everything happens for a reason. B, come follow me and I will send you out to learn to fish for people. And C, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Which did Jesus not say? Amen. Everything happens for a reason. Jesus didn't say that? He, did he say that? He kind of did, did he? He kind of did or not. Well, we're gonna talk about that tonight. That's, that's our subject. How many have heard that whenever someone's trying to explain a, a question that you can't solve, a crisis, a problem, an issue in life, or you see someone hurt or abused, or the big question we always hear is why do bad things happen to good people? How many have heard, well, everything happens for a reason? I have, I have. I've even heard this. Well, the universe, it just it made it happen, you know? All this, yeah. It, I, I think that everything happens for a reason has good intentions. 
I think, and I think there could be a grain of truth in that because if you know the Bible, you know that God is omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. What do those mean? All-knowing, um, he's everywhere, and he's all-powerful. So if you equate that, you think, well, then he doesn't let anything happen without his power and control. But then the, the, the thought becomes, if that's true, then why does he allow bad things to happen? Why does he allow the fires in Maui? Why does he allow people to go without food? Why, why does he allow cancer? Why does he allow someone who's been serving him and praying and asking God, why doesn't he answer prayer? You see how this struggles? Saying everything happens for a reason, in a sense, takes away the consequences of my choices and the consequences of my sin. And it also puts an unnecessary responsibility on God that he makes all things happen, good and bad. And I just don't know if the Bible um, lines up exactly with that. We're going to talk about that tonight. Why do we say something to people when we're trying to help them or to ourselves when we're trying to figure something out? Everything happens for a reason. I think intellectually, the way I'm wired, I have to understand I have the desire as a human to comprehend and to put a frame around everything that happens. I mean, in my mind, two plus two equals, right, yeah. So if I said two plus three equals four, you're like, no. It must be this equation of if God is all powerful and sovereign and all knowing and he's everywhere, then he must, well, I, so intellectually, we, we desire to have resolution, right? But we're putting a constraint on who God is. The other thing I tend to do when I try to reason away everything that happens in life is I, I do it out of a sense of empathy, that we do it not just because of our head knowledge, but how we feel. We don't like pain. We don't like failure. We don't like disappointment. This has happened in our culture that says, well, you can live how you want and you can call yourself any identity because it's so much painful, so you must be all right to do that. It's not so much that it's logical. It feels better to say, do what you want, do what you want to do because it's the way you can frame problems and gaps and questions. And so... The fear of saying things like everything happens for a reason is we begin to create theology. The word theology means the study of God. But we are studying God. We are not framing God. So we have to be very careful when we start giving quick, easy answers to bring our resolution or to feel better about it to people or to ourselves. I've learned to say this in my life. You are God, I am not. Can you say that with me? You are God, I am not. You are unlimited, I am limited. You see all, I see a perspective. There is something I learned, I took the uh, classes in theology uh, just a couple years ago, and there's a concept called process theology. I love this because when we talk about bad things that happen in life, the hurricanes, the cancer, the struggle, the divorce, the abuse, process theology says we see halfway through the movie the bad things, the tensions, the dissonance in the movie. But God is processing life from Genesis to Revelation. And at the end of the process, he will get the glory all things will be made new. All wrong things will be made right. Two plus two will equal four. In the book of Revelation, we know we win. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. All things will be made new because he's the great I am. He's the first and the last, the alpha and omega. He is the perfecter and the author of our faith. So even though we don't have all the answers, we know who has the answers. Amen? Amen. I remember uh, as a young 20-year-old, 20 22-year-old pastor, 
I was put in a situation way beyond where I was ready for. I don't know why the overseer over me didn't coach me, help me, and be with me. He didn't. So here I was, 22, I was a worship pastor in a church, and I guess they were down on pastors, and there was this couple in the church in their mid-30s going through awful marriage issues. Both of them, second marriage. There was one or two kids from a previous marriage. There was physical abuse, emotional abuse. Here I am, 22 years old, (laughs) sitting at my little desk as the pastor mat with them. They're crying, they're arguing, telling me all these violent, awful things. I'm like, oh. And I'm interrupting them too often trying to share scripture verses and give answers. And well, this is the reason why this is what you should do. I've been married to my wife for two years, no kids, telling them how to figure out these marriage issues. They were frustrated. I was frustrated. They were confused. I was confused. Their marriage didn't last. And I went to my mentor and said, that was awful. And I feel bad to that to this day. What I learned through that is to listen more, talk less, ask questions and listen again. And then here's the key for you. I learned to say, I don't know. It's all right as a Christian and a believer in Jesus to say, I don't know. Can we practice that together? I don't know. Well, why did God give me cancer? Why is inflation? I can't afford to buy a house in West Palm Beach. Why is LeBron James not getting his fifth NBA championship ring? I just threw that in there for extra. It's all right to not have the easy answers and not to fully understand the truth of it. It doesn't change God's word. His truth is immutable. It means it never changes. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit through imperfect men. Well, why does the Bible this or that? I don't know. But I want to tell you, I don't want to just leave you with listening and asking questions and saying, I don't know. I want to tell you how you can respond in your own life to people around you and to the world because you and I are called to shout Jesus from the streets and the rooftops, amen? We're called to be the light and darkness. You are, when I see you, I'm gonna stop my message for a second. When I'm down here seeing you jump and worship and sing and even showing up tonight, it inspires me that you love Jesus and you have a calling in your life just like I did when I was 22 years old. Keep fanning the flame of Jesus in your life. You don't have to fully understand him to follow him. Just keep trusting in him, learning and growing, and you're gonna grow in your faith, amen? Okay, so to to illustrate this point I'm making of everything may or may not uh, resolve or have a reason, what do I do with this? How do I live in this tension of gaps in my life. There's a story in the Bible of three young adults, three young men that found themselves in an upside down culture, just like you and I live in. They were actually taken out of all comfort zone and familiarity. In fact, they were taken out of their own country to a company, a country that, that was the enemy that took them away as slaves You know, we celebrate America, land of the free, home of the brave, and I have my rights and my freedom. Well, they had all that taken away. There's no entitlement and rights there. Could you imagine? And not only were they taken to this foreign land, their culture was stripped from them. You're not allowed to worship the way you went. In fact, they even changed their names. We're so big about Instagram, Instagram and Facebook. All that was taken away from them. You be like us. You learn this new way. So they're already in a, and make this, to make this from bad to worse, the king of this nation was so into himself, did not serve God, did not honor Jesus, that he said, I'm making a great golden image of myself. And I want you and all the nations of the world, when the trumpets sound, to bow down to worship and acknowledge me as Lord. Could you imagine the pressure of that? It's one thing to live in the culture. It's another to resist the culture. I'm talking about Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego in the book of Daniel. Let's look at this this little scripture passage. And this is to illustrate what do you do 
when you don't understand why all these things are happening? What, what happens when you're praying, God, deliver me out of this? Deliver me out of this problem, this anxiety, this problem, I'm overwhelmed. And what happens if God, it feels like he's not there. It feels like he's not responsive. I wanna show you what these three young adults do. Show that scripture on this verse. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Stop right there. I am learning I don't have to defend Jesus. I just have to live Jesus. I'm not saying there's not times to speak it and preach and speak. What I'm saying is be careful on social media. You don't have to fight against other things or speak against things. Jesus can defend himself. In fact, the best way they're going to see Jesus in you is not what you say, but what you do, how you live. The way that you're showing up on a Tuesday night after work, after homework says Jesus. But when you come on Sunday morning and you serve, not just consume, you're showing the heart of Jesus. Amen? If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But, everybody say but, even if he does not, we're not forcing God to do what he wants to do. Amen? Even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. I love this response of these young adults who don't fully understand God at this time. They didn't know Jesus, the Messiah. They knew God of Israel, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're in this foreign land, and what they said is, God is able, but even if he doesn't choose to save us and we're gonna die in the fiery furnace, we're still gonna point to Jesus. I tell you what, that gets the attention of your family, at people at school, at work. I'm not defending, I'm not fighting, I'm living in a way that whatever happens to me, they're gonna see Jesus. Isn't that great? That's so great. So we see the response here of the king. He sees that these boys are thrown in the fiery furnace. Of course, you've, if you've read the story, um, the, the soldiers who carry them to the fiery furnace, the fire is so intense it burns them, but these young men aren't burned. In fact, they don't even, their clothes aren't seared. They don't even smell like smoke. They're standing and they're like, no big deal, in a fire, and it gets the attention of the king. He says, weren't there three men that were tied up and threw into the fire? Certainly, your majesty, they said. Look, I see four men walking around the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. I love this. He says the gods. We know there's one God, but these pagan people in America who don't believe in God, they think the Bible is a myth, they think it's gods, they think they're the gods, whatever. They're not gonna understand God, but they're gonna see God through your faithfulness and your adversity. They're gonna be revealed to the son who looks like the God. Now, there's many different interpretations. If it was the, the uh, angel Gabriel or an angel, I believe, my theory is, this isn't theology, that it was the pre-incarnate Jesus. Because here's why. Here's the first promise that we know. Jesus said, I will be with you. It is the promise of his presence. He says, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I wrote here, God doesn't promise us answers, but he promises his presence. That's the first principle you and I can say to our lives and to people around us. You may say, I don't know, but what I do know is Jesus is always with me. Can I hear an amen? amen. Jesus is always there. Now, I have theories about why, this, why God allowed this to happen. I think it's to bring glory to God because we see uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he says, 
Praise be to God. I'm going down a little farther here. I'm going to skip through this verse. Praise be to God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb. It's a little bit aggressive, I would think. And their house was laid in ruins. Didn't have to do that, Nebuchadnezzar. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Listen. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Babylon. So beautiful that this pagan king acknowledges God as Lord through the adversity. You know what I'm learning in my life? I'm 50 years old now. I'm learning to embrace pain, not avoid it. I'm learning to understand struggle and suffering in my life and not try to make excuses about it. Now, hear me, I'm not praying for pain. I like a couch in a Starbucks, can I hear an amen? But when it comes, when adversity comes, when depression comes, when loneliness comes, I'm learning in my life, sometimes God doesn't remove it right away. He allows it to abide there to show that he is so much greater than that. Let me tell you something. You'll never learn the muscles in your life to build emotional resilience if everything is nice and easy and perfect. I don't think God creates pain. I think a broken world creates pain. I think my choices and my sin and consequences, there is something called cause and effect. If you do this, this will happen. No choice is a choice. So we have to live in a broken world with our consequences. But here's the deal, that we know Jesus is always with us in those moments. And what I think, when you go through the challenges of your life, that you'll see how truly great Jesus is in the valley experiences. Can I hear an amen? So the first promise we can say is, I don't know, but number one promise is, Jesus is with me. The second promise is, Jesus said, I will work it out for your good. I will work it out for your good. I wrote here, we can't say what God will do, but we can say who he is. I I don't know what he's gonna do. I don't know if he's gonna save me. I don't know if he's gonna make this happen. I don't know if I'm gonna have the money or not have the money. I'm not sure if I'm gonna graduate or not graduate, but I know who he is. And what God does is he makes dead things come to a life. He takes sick things and he heals things. This is his character. This is his word. He takes things that are sinful and he forgives them. He redeems broken things. He, he goes after the sheep, the, the, the one sheep, leaves the 99. His heart is for people. This is why at our church we don't preach against people. We preach for people to come to Jesus. Amen. I love what um, the Apostle Paul said in Romans 8, 28. He says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together. Can we say that all things? All things work together for good. God is a good God. He's a good God. And he doesn't cause all things because he's sovereign. He gave us free choice, but he works all things together for good, I love this, for those who are called for his purpose. How many feel a calling on your life from God? You're not quite sure, but you feel like God has something for you. Every hand should be up. And if you don't, that's all right. But I'm telling you, one day you're gonna discover why God puts you on earth and you're gonna find why he allowed you to go through some failure and difficulty and loneliness and God forbid, abuse that happened to you, and why you made some poor choices that were sinful choices that you're living the consequences, God somehow turns all of those things, mixes it up in his holiness, he turns dead things to life, and he makes something beautiful out of your life. Do you believe that? Okay, so my last story, and then we'll close. I told you about my young years as a pastor talking to the couple and giving scriptures and giving anecdotes and giving things and that didn't go well. I've learned to listen. 
and be in the moment with people and almost be a representative of Jesus to be the presence of Jesus with them in the moment. I remember in my office a few years ago, there was a couple from the Stewart campus who were serving faithfully good people. And uh, I sat with the mom knowing that just a month ago, their young adult son, his name was Jacob, was tragically killed on I-95 one night walking. I don't know if there was some drugs going on, I think. He was always kind of the wayward child. They have other kids that are older that have been fine. These are godly, a godly family. They serve in the church. They're leaders in the church. And yet this one son has always wayward and he was tragically killed. And they were just trying to make sense of it. And we just sat in my office and I said, I don't know why God allowed you to have to experience a loss of your son. I have a son right here. I can't imagine something like that happening to him. And just to sit with them and to say, I don't know what God is doing, but I know that Jesus loves your son. I know Jesus is gonna be with you through this whole experience. And I know somehow God is gonna turn all those things around for a good purpose. A year later, we were celebrating something at the Stewart campus and this couple was there. Pastor Julie Mullins was there visiting, celebrating. I forget what it was, what it was, Louis. We were there celebrating. And this couple had made a significant gift to the church financially and they're serving. They were in leadership college, beautiful time. And I can't tell you all the words that were said in my office with Pastor Julie and this couple, but we cried tears of, of joy and tears of meaning to say, God is using your life to reach many young adults today at Stewart Camp. I was at Stewart Campus this weekend celebrating 15 years and they were there with us. And their life is touching campuses and leaders and they're investing in people. And Pastor Julie prophesied the most beautiful prayer over Ann and Bob to say, God is using your life. He's going to use this tragedy for beautiful things. And I want to tell you, whatever tragedy, whatever question you have, whatever disappointment you have, you can trust two things. Jesus is with you in the fire. And number two, he's going to turn it for good for those who were called for a holy purpose. If you feel like God has called you for something, a purpose in your life, will you stand right now to say yes, Lord, to the purpose? And a father who's here of these young adults, I just want to pray a pastoral prayer over you, a prophetic prayer about your calling and your future. You can trust your past with God and you can also trust God with your future. And you don't have to solve all the answers and everything be equated and resolute in your life. You just have to follow Jesus and watch him work in your life. And so if you bow your heads in prayer, I just wanna pray over you tonight. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you are a God that is present in times of trouble. You never leave us nor forsake us. You are attentive from heaven down to earth to every young man and every young woman tonight. You see the struggles, the anxieties. You know the prayer requests because you say in your word, you hear our prayers. And Lord, I pray that you give them a patience in the waiting. Give them a holy capacity to trust you in the times when it doesn't all make sense. Lord, I pray also that you give them a picture that you're going to work all the things, all the tensions, all the unsolved issues into a beautiful story and tapestry where you're going to use their life because it's not just about them. It's through them that you're going to use every point in their life for a beautiful, holy purpose. And we thank you, Lord, that you're a good God. We live in a broken world, but we serve a good God. I thank you, Lord, for your moving tonight. 